الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. My brothers and sisters, we were tossing between which topics to start after we just finished the topic on قضاء and قدر. And uh, we thought at the moment most of the young people are at school and uh, we have a mix of older people coming to the masjid. Of course this is recorded and so you can, you know, it will spread throughout the world inshallah eventually. So we decided at the moment to go with a little bit of history history, Islamic history. But I don't want to talk about the politics of it or just boring historical facts. I always like to talk about what is relevant to us today and how we can benefit from learning about Islamic history so we can practice it in our lives today. So what I've decided to talk about now is a short series about the rightly guided caliphates al khulafa al rashidun khulafa al rashidun are the successors of prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who took over the leadership and responsibility of the entire Muslim world, the Ummah, and continued throughout history with what we call the Islamic Empire, Khilafa, Caliphate, governments, throughout the centuries until it ended in 1924. But I want to focus on what we call the rightly guided Khalifs, who are literally the Khalifas, the Caliphates, the leaders, the successors named Abu Bakr, as Siddiq radiallahu anhu, after him Umar ibn al Khattab radiallahu anhu, after him Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, and then after him Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And then briefly, one lesson about a fifth Khalifa who is very closely related in character and justice to those four. His name was Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. He was not a companion though. And he only ruled for two years. But I want to focus on that era the most. Because the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, himself, he praised them and he told us to follow their sunnah, to follow their practice. And each one of them is different to the other, subhanAllah. And each one of their era is so different to the one before. And the way they governed and led are so different. And their characteristics, their mindset, and the way they dealt with people are so different. We want to learn about these great leaders and the people around them. How did they lead in Islam? What problems did they face? Are those problems familiar to us today? Are they same as what Muslims go through today? What kind of character and religion and spirituality that these Khalifas had and how were those around him, around them? Can we learn from their spiritual religion, religion, from their religious practice and their spirituality, their Iman? How did they deal with tough situations? How do we deal with tough situations today? Did they deal with non-Muslims? who tried to attack Islam and Muslims, how did they deal with them? Did non-Muslims live among them? 
How did they treat them? How did they, how did the non-Muslims live their lives during those Khalifa times? How did the Muslims treat the non-Muslims? What were the rights and privileges that were given to the Muslims in a Khalifa state? Is it similar to today? Are things that happen today that, are, that show justice and looking after people, did they originate? Did these ideas come from the Khalifa systems? Did they come from Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali? For example, here in Australia, we have a lot of laws which focus on fairness and justice for the people. Example, the, fi the, uh, the Centrelink system. The help that you get from the medical system such as the Medicare and healthcare system. The right to have a say in politics and workers' rights and employment rights and business laws, trade and fair trade that we have here in Australia and other parts of the world. Did they have these types of things happening in their time in the Khalifa system? My brothers and sisters, I think that we all must, must learn about these rightly guided Khalifa eras after Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is essential for every young person and old person to know it in detail. But what I'm going to talk about, insha'Allah, in these series, as I said before, is not about the controversial politics that happened in those days. I am going to mention them. I am going to talk about them. But what I want to take from them are lessons for us to learn so that we can learn about how to solve our conflicts in our time between us as Muslims. We want to learn about how do we live our life with our identity, our Islamic identity, in the ever so changing world, societies that we live in, different countries that we live in. Do we really have to be exactly like the time of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali for us to move forward in our religion and our faith? Or can we learn from their lives and from their eras that no matter what happens in the world, what country we live in, what society we live in, what changes happen in our education system, politics, can we still learn from them to still be strong Muslims with a strong identity and still live among all these people in harmony and in some way of equality and unity together without losing our Islamic identity and practices? How do we work through it? Brothers and sisters, I think the study of the Khulafa is a huge essential solution for us to understand our times today. You might think that it's way in the past. It was 1,000 for nearly 1,400 years ago. But brothers and sisters, the Muslim Ummah today, everywhere in the world and our state, is a continuation from that time till today. And we still have, from those days, practices today that equal the modern world and some of them, wallahi, even outdate. Outdate the modern world. And I'll just give you one example. We still have literature that is from them till today without the change of a letter. That is our constitution and our guide that no one can dispute. Who knows what it is? What is it? What is it? The Quran. The Quran. The Quran outdates every time and every era. If it didn't, we would not have it intact to the last letter. 
And if it was up to you and me to preserve it, some people think the Quran is because Muslims preserve it. We don't preserve it. We cannot preserve it. it we did not preserve it. We never did. And we didn't preserve it through writing or through printers. No. It is preserved because Allah is the one who preserves it. It is impossible for a human to preserve it because the language of the Quran, yes, it's in Arabic, but the way it is, the way it's spoken is not of human ability. So how can we preserve something which we as humans cannot make like? We can't preserve it. As soon as something goes wrong, we don't know how to bring it back together the way it was. There'll be differing things in the Quran. Why am I saying this, brothers and sisters? Our Quran connects us to that time. And what led them and helped them to establish a just, fair, harmonious, peaceful uh, society to a certain extent and solve their problems when things went wrong was, was the same constitution that we have today, the Quran. The Quran they had, the life that they led, the solutions that they, their solutions, even though they had different problems, their solutions all came from the Quran and what we have today, the Quran. And secondly, from the Sunnah. The Sunnah means the life example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All the verses of the Quran and all the hadiths, the words of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his actions, which he left behind, the authentic ones, of course, they are our source till today that they had 1,400 years ago from where we solve all of our problems. So long as we are sincere, truthful, sincere and truthful, and that our aim is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number one, not for any selfish reason, not for racism, not for nationalism, not for capitalism, not for money, not for family, not for ourselves. Islam is a higher purpose. And nobody can know morals, right and wrong. What is morally right? What is morally wrong? What is ethically right? What is ethically wrong? No one in the world can decide that. We will always change, except through religion. Religion is the thing that tells us about right and wrong, morals. Science cannot. I have a science background. There is nothing in science which tells you this is right, this is wrong. They can't tell you morals. It just tells you how the world works. You decide the morals. And people have so many different morals. One minute, this is okay. Next minute, oh, we have a problem. This should be okay. Now, everybody differs. But the Quran and religion, they decide that. And let's see, inshallah, from here, how we can benefit from the lives of the Khulafa al-Rashidun. I call them Rashidun, the rightly guided, because the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, called them the rightly guided. The rightly guided caliphs. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali and some scholars have also considered a fifth Khalifa Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and I also agree with that and accept that so just a very quick history of the caliphate system the history of the caliphates I just want to give you a very brief history you need to know your legacy brothers and sisters you need to know your heritage your Islamic heritage you and me no matter what color we are where we've come from male or female doesn't matter who you are you and I belong to a fraternity a brotherhood system that is ever so old and so strong we are called Muslims we are not named after someone we don't know after a place. We are not Mohammedans, for example. We are not Jesusans or Christians or we are not Mosesans. We are not Quranites. We are not Hadithians. We are not named after places, Medinians or Meccans or Arabians. We are not named after any such thing or, or race or nationality or race or ethnicity. Muslim is a description. It's an identity of a description. It means those who truly choose to submit and believe in what Allah has revealed in the Quran and to his messengers, the final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna 
Muhammad Rasulullah, the one who says, I bear witness that there is only one God worthy of worship, and Muhammad وسلم, is his final prophet and messenger. That's it. This is what unites us. Everything else is secondary. Everything else. And this is what the caliphate system is based on. Now, before I begin, among the best resources, I think, for Islamic history, which I use the majority of in presenting this series to you today, is from a book called, a historic book, a reference from the 11th century called Al Bidaya wa Nihaya, the beginning and the end. One of the most, one of the top most reliable sources of Islamic history in our Ummah by the great Imam Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir. Why? Because Imam Ibn Kathir, as the scholars say, he was not only a scholar, but he was what we call a muhaqqiq and muhaddith. A muhaqqiq means he was a historian who was a researcher and an investigator. He made sure and investigated, this was his art, to, 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 to sift between historical information because it's very hard to find accurate historical information. And he's also a muhaddith. He was a scholar, a scientific scholar of hadith, what the Prophet said. He sifted through them like archaeology. He, he, he made sure he was, he, had the, the, he, he was a scholar of the science of hadith. So he was able to tell us and rely upon hadith, which he himself could trace back to its authenticity and with historically accurate information, at least to a very high extent. Not everything he said was absolutely correct. Some information of the past, he got them from Israelite traditions. But the Islamic history, the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, and the Khilafah, this book is excellent. And every other books that were made, they kind of take from this fountain. Others are Tariq al-Tabari and others like that, but the most authentic, Allah knows best, is this one. There is also a, a beautiful podcast that uh, highly educated brothers living with us here, here in Melbourne. They're actually one of my, some of my close friends. We went to uni together. And, you know, they're like highly educated, mashaAllah. When you speak to them, you think they're walking dictionaries, tabarakallah. And they made uh, a few years back something called Islamic Legacy. That's what it's called, Islamic Legacy. It's still, you can look it up on, on um, I think, uh, just, just type Islamic Legacy. And inshallah, there is an app for them. And you can listen to it. They did it about the, most of the Islamic history, the Mongol scourge they call it when the mongols came in in the 11th and 12th century they talk about the crusade era they talk about the ayyubid dynasty they talk about you know the ottoman empire they, it's amazing if you want to learn about that because i'm not going to talk about all that stuff the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam said this hadith is authenticated by imam shaykh al-albani and it is within the six authentic books he said إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ بَعْدِي فَسَيَرَ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِّينَ مِنْ بَعْدِي تَمَسَّكُوا بِهَا وَعَضُّوا عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِزِ وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَمُحْدَثَاتِ الْأُمُورِ فَإِنَّ كُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالًا The Prophet وسلم, said before he died, he said, whoever of you lives after me, he's talking to his companions, Whoever of you lives after me for a while, they are going to see many conflicts. Conflicts and differing opinions. Among who? Among the Muslims. So he said, So I advise you to stick to my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided caliphs who come right after me. Al-Mahdiyin. Al-Mahdiyin means the chosen ones. As if Rasul is saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had willed for them to be those. Min ba'di, after me. They 
held onto my sunnah with the backs of their teeth. And another hadith he said to us, Hold on to it, the backs of your teeth with your molars. And beware of trying to reinvent something new to make it part of this religion when it was not. Making up some new rules and new acts of worship that did not exist, such as to make a six pillar of prayer, for example. Every innovated matter that people make up and they say this is Islam is a misguidance. We're not talking about what helps you practice your religion, like microphones and steps and cars that take you to the masjid. No, no, no. no. Inventions are part of Islamic history and we are encouraged to learn. But to come to the religion and start to twist it around, making haram halal and halal haram, and trying to invent new things saying this is also part of the religion that our Prophet taught us and came down from God. This is called innovations in the religion. My brothers and sisters in Islam, what is a caliph or caliphate? A caliphate or khilafa is an Islamic state under the leadership of an Islamic steward you know, someone who takes after, a responsible leader, with the title of Khalifa, Caliph, a person considered a political religious successor to the Islamic Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as defined, and a leader of the entire Muslim world. Okay? So politics and religion are together in this Islamic State Khilafah. We do not separate Islam and the Quran does not separate rules and politics from religion. Now, when I say politics, I don't mean the corrupt politics where people want to use their whims and desires and play political shifty moves. Islam is based on Islam, on the Quran and Sunnah, and it involves politics, meaning ruling of, of a country, making laws, governing. No one, Islam is not a religion where you just sit in a, a, a dark place or in a cave or just in the mosque or in a church or in a monastery and it's just private and that's it. No, no. Islam is not just private. Private is part of it. That's your spiritual part. But Islam is also, it is, you build, you innovate, you govern, you help. You know, you, it, it's, it's throughout the world. It's inwards and outwards. Islam. My brothers and sisters, the caliphate lasted for about 1,300 and so years. From 632 to the 3rd of March, 1924, after the First World War. It ended in what is today known as Turkey. The Ottoman Empire fell and was abolished and replaced with a secularist system where it fell in Turkey. The Khulafa al Rashidun, the rightly guided ones, lasted from 632 to 661, nearly 30 years. The, um, then came after them what they call the Umayyad Caliphate. We're going to call it dynasty. Why dynasty? Because dynasty is when it becomes hereditary. So it stays kind of within a family. The family someone else, they, their heirs, they become the Khalifas. Now this is acceptable in Islam, but it is not the only way. And it is not the best way. And you will see that from then on, more and more conflicts arose to the, to, to, to the fall of, of, the, of the Khilafah. And that's why Rasul said, hold on to the rightly guided ones. You will see that, that this was not hereditary. Then came the Abbasid Caliphate from 750 to 1258 and then the Mamluk dynasty 1261 to 1517 then the Ottoman al from 1517 to 1924 among them and within their time there were other little tiny groups that called themselves a Khalifa for example at the time of the Abbasid uh, sorry the Umayyad time there was something called the uh, the Fatimid dynasty uh, or the Abbasid time, there was the Fatimid dynasty, which ruled for about 200 years. But they only 
ruled in certain parts of the world, like North Africa, like you know, uh, Egypt, uh, Morocco, uh, Sudan, Sicily, the Middle East, and they were called the Ismaili Shia dynasty. The, or not a dynasty, we, we, they're not a dynasty, we can call them the Ismaili Shia, uh, well you can call them kind of a dynasty, what they call their own Khilafah. And they believe that you can only have a Khalifa who comes from the bloodline of Fatima radiallahu anha and Ali radiallahu anha. But they were operating parallel while there was the real Khilafah happening. And they wanted to replace it. But they, the Abbasid Khilafah took them over and they were gone. I'm not going to go into this Shia Sunni business. I'm not here to talk about that. We are talking about what is important to us now. And honestly, Islam is about truth. We need to know what is the truth without emotions. And I do not lean towards any particular group or agenda of any sort. I am, alhamdulillah, a follower of the Sunni Islam, which is the mainstream. And it is what I believe has, we, Rasul has left us on. And that is what is important. My brothers and sisters, the Rashidun, the rightly guided Khalifs, they were elected by Muslims or agreed upon by the Muslims, the community, majority of the community. From 661 onwards, as I said, it became hereditary. And there was a little tiny dynasty called the Ayyubid dynasty, the Salahuddin al Ayyubi dynasty that happened a little while. And you know what? Islamic empire, the Islamic empire spread throughout the world after the Prophet ﷺ to reach more than 13.5 million kilometers square of this entire earth. That's like nearly, that's like a third of the earth almost, which became the largest empire ever seen and the sixth largest in number in the history of this world. It was huge. It was huge. And the advancement in technology is blows your mind away. You talk about telescopes, you talk about maths, you talk about engineering, you talk about science of all sorts in every area, biology, medicine. Even, I have to say, even music and notes and instruments and singing and also clothing and art and design and you know, it was unbelievable. Telescopes today, as I said, for example, a lot of it was taken on by the Muslims afterwards. Hospitals, psych psychology wards, you know, mental illness institutions, nursery, so as in nursing and nursery, agriculture and nursing, medical, uh, including uh, midwifery and doctors and, you know, even everything, all of that stuff was reignited and started by the Muslims. One of them, the first university was by a Muslim scholar, Fatima al-Fahiri, and also psychological wards. All of these came from where? They came within the Islamic era, subhanAllah. My brothers and sisters, now I will move on to talk about an introduction tonight to the first Khalifa, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, do we have any questions for now? Alhamdulillah. Is that a good sort of overall? Okay, Alhamdulillah. What I want to do is I want to talk about these men and the women and men around them. I want to learn about their life so that I can emulate them. We want the young people to have them as their heroes and their role models. We want the young people and the old people to look at them as the great leaders of this earth, mashaAllah. And what they did was remarkable and no one can match them. No one can match them. These khulafa were the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They lived with him, ate with him, fought with him, hurt with him, rose with him, spent intimate time with him. They, 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 they traveled with him and they spent so much, the majority of their time with him, their lives. Abu Bakr spent the most time with the Prophet ﷺ. Ali anhu spent 
the earliest time with the Prophet ﷺ. He was his direct cousin from a very young age as a boy, from the time he was born. We are going to learn remarkable things about this, these most amazing character that no one can match in the history of this world. Without further ado, let's talk about the first Khalifa, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. His name is... Abu Bakr, which is his name, his, his, his nickname is Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, the father of Bakr. But in Arabic, it doesn't literally mean he had a son named Bakr. It means the, the man of Bakr. What does it mean? Bakr means the first calf or the first camel born. Why? Why do you think it was named after a camel or a calf? In the ancient, in the, in the Arab uh, world and in some cultures today, uh, using animals names um, gives a particular description of a person and it was nothing wrong with it you know it's like when you say to somebody you are a lion nobody you know says anything about that and Arabs they had certain names of certain animals which gave a particular characteristic described that person why was he learned the first camel the first calf the camel serves people the camel is patient the camel can persevere the camel can go days and weeks without food or water. The camel is an amazing being which is mentioned in the Quran and Abu Bakr was called that, which tells you a lot about his characteristic. His tribe was called uh, Taim and he was from a place from the tribe of Quraysh, the same tribe of who? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His real name is Abdullah. That's his name. Abu Bakr Dalano is Abdullah. The son of Uthman. His father's name was Uthman. But we know him. History books will call him Abu Quhafa. So he was called Ibn Abu Quhafa. And there were many poetries and nasheeds made about him. Yabna Abi Quhafa. That was his name. He used to have a name before Abdullah. And the Prophet ﷺ changed it. His name before Abdullah was Abdul Kaaba. The slave of the Kaaba. But the Prophet ﷺ changed it to the slave of Allah. Naming is very important. It is haram to name people or your children after these types of names. To call them the slave of the Kaaba or the slave of the Prophet. Some people call themselves today Abdul Nabi, for example, slave of the Prophet. Or disgusting names, named after disgusting things. Obviously, these are haram to name. But a good name, a name that has a good meaning, is good. It doesn't have to be, some people say Islamic name and they think of things like, you know, they think of names like uh, Umar and Bilal. And Yes, they are Islamic, meaning they are good names and they are named after great role models. But it doesn't have to be that way. A good name with a good meaning is enough for a Muslim and something easy on the tongue, which has a good meaning. Obviously, naming after these great figures makes you become a great figure. It kind of changes you. And that's why when you see people who know their religion and they want to get up to some hanky-panky, if his name is Muhammad, he calls himself Mo, right? Or Al or something like that. It's a bit embarrassing to call yourself a good name, a beautiful name when you're doing wrong things. And that's, that's kind of a good thing, you know, that, that, that we, don't, we try not to use that name when it represents something so high. But what I'm saying is we should live up to those names, inshallah. Without going even further on that, we'll say uh, his mother's name was Salma, or it was called Ummul Khair, the mother of goodness. So you can see, brothers and sisters, his entire family is based on goodness. They were known for goodness. They got beautiful names. They were nicknamed amazing names. His features, what did Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu look like? He was medium height very skinny he was quite slim he had long hair he sometimes had dreadlocks but not very thin dreadlocks thick dreadlocks he used to tie them in dreadlocks sometimes and he was a, had a light tan an Arab tan a light Arab tan in those days they used to call a light tan white <laughs> they used to call them white not like today. When we say white, we mean something else. But in those days, the Arabs, if they saw an Arab with a light tan or anybody with a light tan, they called them white. Guess what they used to call the, 
the white people of today, what they used to call them those days. Not red, they used to call them yellow. Ashab al Asfar. In the Arab world, in, in, in the Arabia, they called them al Asfar because they were blonde. Okay, Shab al Ahmar, the red, was kind of maybe among them, but the Byzantines, for example, the Romans, were called Shab al Asfar because they were blondish. So the, the colors in those days were different. Anyway, Abu Bakr who looked like that. What about his character? He was a successful businessman, an entrepreneur of the highest degree. Very successful entrepreneur, businessman, very wealthy. He was extremely honest, truthful, trustworthy, warm-hearted, soft-spoken, gentle nature. He had empathy. He, can, he, he used to feel for other people. And he was very generous. He always gave money when suffering happened. And I'm talking about him before he became a Muslim and after he became a Muslim. No historical book denies that. Whether Muslim or non-Muslim, even those who are against Islam. No one denies that about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. About this character. He became the most beloved to his community. Before he became a Muslim, he was the most, one of the most beloved to his community. They called him the loved one. Interestingly, Abu Bakr Dilano never worshipped an idol. He was raised among the Arabs of Mecca and they used to worship statues. Abu Bakr Dilano never worshipped a statue, never worshipped an idol. Not because someone told him, but because, subhanAllah, it never made sense to him. He was open-minded. He didn't follow the social norms of his time. He didn't follow just what his parents told him or what the society told him. He wasn't a follower. He thought for himself. And... He has an interesting story. When he was a child, he, his, his fathers and his family used to bring him to the idols. And he, they used to say to him, give the idols food, donate to the idols, give because they will make your life better. And when he was a child, he used to put the food in front of him and look at them and say, eat, eat, eat. But the idols would not talk or eat. So Abu Bakr al-Lanu from a young age, maybe 10 years old or 11, he decided, I'm not going to worship something that can't eat. Can't help me to eat. How, if he can't eat, how can, I, how can it tell me to eat? He doesn't even eat. As a child, this is how he thought. And at some time, he would sit in front of the idols and would say, feed me, feed me. And the idols wouldn't feed him. So, but when he found out about Allah and Islam, he said, Allah is a God you cannot see right now. And everything in this world is evidence that he created it and he feeds us from this, what we see happening now. My brothers and sisters, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, one day he brought a rock when he was a child and he threw it at one of the statues. And it landed on the statue and made a chip in it. And that further made him think, man, I am disgusted by these idols. These are not my gods. If I can throw a rock at it and it can't defend itself, how am I going to ask it to defend me? So this was Abu Bakr as a child and these were similarities between him and Prophet Ibrahim السلام, and Prophet Muhammad They were the same in that way of thinking. It's called the fitra. Abu Bakr who never drank alcohol. He actually forbid alcohol upon himself and the story is because one time after seeing a man he was drunk in Mecca he saw a man drunk and this drunk man he saw fecal material you know fecal matter poo on the floor and the man who was drunk picked up the poo and started to wipe it on himself Abu Bakr who said Oh my God, this is disgusting. I will never touch that stuff that he's drinking. And that made him become disgusted to um, alcohol and wine. So he was never intoxicated. And that is similar to Prophet Muhammad wasallam. He was very close to Prophet in character. And you will see that throughout his time, Whenever Muhammad وسلم, thought he was confused about something, wanted to make an opinion, he would always go to Abu Bakr anhu and he would ask him what he thinks about this opinion and would find that Abu Bakr anhu was thinking exactly the same as him. 
And when Abu Bakr had an opinion, he would go to the Prophet وسلم, and he would find the Prophet وسلم, had the same opinion. So they kind of thought the same. Now when we're saying about opinions, we're not talking about opinions where Allah had already settled it and told him. We're talking about worldly opinions. where Because Islam doesn't tell you about every single thing. We have room to make decisions about certain things in our lives. And he would go to the Prophet وسلم, and find that he had the similar opinion to him. Why was he called as Siddiq? That's his title, Abu Bakr as Siddiq. As Siddiq literally means the honest and truthful one. Actually, it means the one who believed the Prophet in everything. The one who believed the Prophet in everything. Every time the Prophet, peace be upon him, said something, he was the first to say he is truthful. He never hesitated. Everybody hesitated except Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And as Siddiq, that title was really for him. For he was the first man to believe in the messengerhood, messengerhood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that he did not hesitate nor stutter nor doubt a second when he came and told him, Abu Bakr, I am a messenger from God. And he said to him, Sadaqt, you are truthful. And I'm the first to believe in you and follow you. Did not hesitate. And there is a nice story which is in Sahih Muslim and similar to in Sahih Bukhari. An incident happened between him and Umar radiallahu anhu. This is when they were Muslim in Medina. I'm just telling a little story in Medina. Umar radiallahu anhu kind of always had the opposite opinion of Abu Bakr. <laughs> and it was so much so that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to say, if Abu Bakr and Umar, if you two ever agreed on one thing, don't even ask me. It has to be right. Because you never agree. They were so different in the way they thought. So one time, Abu Bakr anhu had a little altercation with Umar. Anhu. And this time, Abu Bakr anhu, it was his fault. It was Abu Bakr's fault. He made a mistake. And a little bit with Umar. Umar's nature was quite stern and tough. He'd get angry and then he calms down. And so Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, after wronging Umar with something small, he became very sad about what he did and apologized to Umar and said, Umar, please forgive me. But Umar radiallahu anhu couldn't forgive him just yet. He said, I can't right now. Just give me some space. <laughs> so Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu went to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And he was crying. Why is he crying? Not because he wants Umar to be his favorite or to like him. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he fears God. He doesn't want on a day of judgment to face Allah and Umar has not forgiven him. So he said, Ya Rasul Allah, I did this and Umar radiallahu did not forgive me and I tried. Please, Ya Rasul Allah, help me and save me. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, yeah, he said, um, counsel, like be a mediator between me and him. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Ya Abu Bakr, Allah has already forgiven you. Allah has already forgiven you. Why? Suddenly, Umar anhu comes in. As I told you, Umar anhu, he gets angry, then phew, calms down and becomes the best. Came into the masjid and he had calmed down. As soon as he saw the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet saw him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, looked unhappy with Umar. That petrified Umar radiallahu anhu. Because he's the messenger of God. If the messenger of God is unhappy, are displeased with you, that means Allah is going to be displeased with you. Umar was petrified. He became pale and could not speak anymore. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he realized, remember I told you he's got empathy. He saw Umar in that state. He saw Muhammad وسلم, in that state. He doesn't want Umar to be to have the Prophet displeased with him. So Abu Bakr rushed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and sat on his knees. He went down to his knees. He held on to the Prophet وسلم, and said, Ya Rasulallah, please, please be pleased with Umar. It was my fault. He didn't do anything. Then the Prophet وسلم, said, I called people to Islam. Everybody thought over it, at least for a while. All except Abu Bakr. He believed me. 
the moment I told him about Islam, he accepted it without any hesitation, nor stutter, nor doubt. Won't you all leave my best friend alone? Won't you all leave my best friend alone? In another hadith in Sahih Bukhari, number 3661, he said, Allah sent me to you all. You all said, I lied in the beginning. But Abu Bakr said, you have spoken the truth. He also supported me with his own self and his wealth. So are you all going to leave my companion alone or not? Are you all going to leave my companion alone or not? He was never harmed by anyone after that day. Abu Bakr radiallahu Nobody dared to upset him even a little bit after that day. What is this rank and his character that Abu Bakr radiallahu has with the Prophet sallallahu and with Allah? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala automatically forgave him even though Umar radiallahu did not forgive him. Something is so highly different about him because his heart was something else and look what he did his love for Umar for all his companions my brothers and sisters the Prophet was once climbing up the mountain of Uhud there was a mountain there called Uhud which the Prophet loved and he said it, its origin is from Jannah the hadith is in Sahih Bukhari he was climbing up and Uhud began to rumble. It began to shake. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Uthbut Uhud, O Uhud, be stable. For walking on top of you right now is a prophet and a Siddiq, one who is who believes in the Prophet, and two martyrs. Who were the two martyrs? The Prophet, he said, It was me, the Prophet. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and two martyrs was Umar and Ali radiallahu anhu. What does it mean martyrs? It means they were going to be killed in the name of Allah and murdered while upholding what pleases Allah. They will be killed because of Islam. So they were called martyrs. You'll hear, you'll know about this story later on inshallah. And by the way, these series, they're going to go maybe for about 8 or 10. And that's called a summary. <laughs> so inshallah, we'll enjoy it. Another time was Isra al Ma'raj. You all know the story of the Prophet ﷺ when he ascended to the heavens. And he journeyed by night from Mecca to Jerusalem. It's in Surah Al-Isra. من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير. In Surah Al-Isra, verse one, Allah says, "Glory be to He who who took His His who took His servant Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم by night." from the sacred mosque in Mecca to the sacred mosque in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, around and surroundings that we have blessed in order to show him some of our divine signs, our miracles. Verily, Allah is all uh, the one who hears your call and the one who sees. When he went and went into the heavens and came back by night, he came back to Mecca. And what happened? The first one to hear about it was Abu Jahl. He was the most tyrant leader of Quraysh. And he always had it in for the Prophet So he used and said, Okay, this is the time I'm going to show how this man is a madman. This is good. And he went around telling people, look at what he's saying. He went from Mecca to Jerusalem. Uh, no cars, no planes, nothing over there. In one night, and he went into the heavens. <laughs> Guys, we told you he's, he's mad. That's what he said. Then they approached Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr was a, a very respectable man and they wanted to take him away from the Prophet Sallallahu So they came up to Abu Bakr and they said to him, listen to what your friend is saying. Abu Jahl said to him, listen to what your friend is saying. Come on, man. Are you going to say he's truthful? And what did Abu Bakr say? He said, In qalaha, if Muhammad Sallallahu truly said that, فَقَدْ صدق. He is truthful. فَإِنِّي صَدَّقْتُ صَدَّقْتُهُ بِشَيْءٍ أَكْثَرْ مِنْ ذَلِكَ I believed in, in, in him in something even greater than that. 
I believe that he received words from above seven heavens down to earth, which he received the Quran. Of course, I believe him. So he was called As Siddiq. My brothers and sisters, he was the first man to convert to Islam. Absolute first man to convert to Islam. The first woman is Khadija radiallahu anha, and the first child is Ali radiallahu anha. He was the only Sahabi, the only companion whose entire family household converted to Islam. Some before others. The last of them was his father, Abu Quhafa, Uthman. And he converted to Islam before the death of the Prophet وسلم, in the 11th year of Hijrah. So two years before the Prophet died. And there is an amazing story about that. Insha'Allah, we will talk about it in next class. He was the first of the ten guaranteed paradise by name in one hadith. He was the closest friend to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet peace be upon him said, If I were to choose a title of best friend from among my ummah, I would have chosen Abu Bakr. But he is my closest companion and brother. The hadith is in Muslim. And another hadith he said, But Allah has chosen me as his Khalil, as his companion. Khalil means the closest one to him. As he chose Ibrahim alayhi salam. So because Allah is Khalil of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam couldn't choose Abu Bakr. But if it wasn't for that, he would have. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam received help from Abu Bakr before anyone else all the time. The Prophet peace be upon him said once, the hadith is in Ibn Majah, no wealth has ever benefited me like the way Abu Bakr's wealth benefited me. Abu Bakr, when he heard this, when the Prophet sallallahu said this, Abu Bakr started to cry. And he said, and what is myself and my wealth but all yours to begin with, O Messenger of Allah? Like, you don't even need to say that. My wealth and myself is all for you. The Prophet ﷺ then replied, None I owe anything to except Abu Bakr, for he used his self and property for me more than anyone else. Let all the doors to the masjid be closed except the door of Abu Bakr. Anhu. And he said these words before he died by a few days. There were many doors in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. وسلم, where people used to enter from and after his death he said before his death he said close all these doors and make one entrance for everybody because they were named after different people he said except for the door of Abu Bakr who keep it open always for all people until today we still have the door of Abu Bakr عنه, you enter into the Masjid al-Nabawi right from the front kind of from the right side and you enter of the door of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Later on, other doors were opened uh, in different, just to accommodate people. The Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, one day, they were sitting on the edge of a well, and the hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. And Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he was sitting on the edge of this well, it's called the well of uh, Aris, uh, known well over there, and he had his his trousers, his, his uh, thawb or his trousers, it was kind of lifted up. Prophet ﷺ had his clothing lifted up. And he had with him the companion Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. He said, I could see the Prophet's whiteness of his thighs. Bayadu fakhidayh. Which means that the aura of a man is from the navel to the knee, but it, is, it can also be a little bit above the knee. From this hadith, that the Prophet ﷺ, a little bit of the, a little bit above his knee was shown, and a door knocked. There was a door there. Prophet ﷺ said, "Don't let anyone enter until you ask me." And then Ya Rasulullah, he said, "It is Abu Bakr." He said to him, "Let him enter, and give him good news that he will be in paradise." Then another knock. He said, "It is Umar, Ya Rasulullah." The Prophet peace be upon him said, let him in and give him good news that he will be in paradise. 
Then a third knock, it was Uthman radiallahu anhu. He said, let him in and give him good news that he will be in paradise, but only after a calamity befalls him. And we're going to learn about what happened to Uthman radiallahu anhu with this calamity. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he sat next to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to his right. When Umar radiallahu anhu came in, he sat next to Abu Bakr to his right. When Uthman radiallahu anhu came in, he didn't find much room. And Uthman was shy. His nature was shy. We'll talk about him when it comes. And he went around. He didn't want to inconvenience everybody. So he sat in front of them on the other side of the well. And when he entered, the Prophet وسلم, put his trousers down. He rolled them back down. And when he was asked by Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, why did you do that, Ya Rasulullah, when Uthman radiallahu anhu entered? And there's another hadith with Aisha radiallahu anhu in a similar way. But he didn't do it with Abu Bakr and Umar. He said, how can I not be embarrassed or respectful in a shy way in front of a man whom the angels are shy in front of? And he was Uthman radiallahu anhu. He was so modest and shy in nature. The scholars interpret this incident in the following way. They said this was the foretold clue that when the Prophet وسلم, died, Abu Bakr anhu was going to succeed him, followed by Umar, followed by Uthman. Also, it is the foretold clue that when Muhammad وسلم, was, being, was buried, Abu Bakr's grave was going to be next to his on his right, and Umar's grave was going to be next to Abu Bakr عنه, on his right. And Uthman عنه, was going to be buried elsewhere. And he truly is buried in Al Baqiyah. A little bit of a distance. Al Baqiyah is, is a big graveyard next to the Prophet's mosque. And truly, till today, subhanAllah, 1,400 years later, the grave of the Prophet, وسلم, Abu Bakr, and Umar are exactly like that. SubhanAllah, from that incident, the scholars say that was foretold. So there are many hints and signs in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that shows Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu that he will be the successor and his relationship to the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. How much time do we have left for Aisha? How much? Two minutes. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop here as an introduction to the series of the Khulafa al-Rashidun, the rightly guided caliphs. I've now introduced to you Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu in his character, his name and brief stories around the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to know what kind of a man we are talking about. Insha'Allah next week on Wednesday, it will be school holidays, insha'Allah, but I will continue in the school holidays unless something comes up. Look it up on the Preston Mosque Omar al-Khattab Facebook page. Um, insha'Allah next week we'll talk about his early life in Mecca. And we'll go through the story of how he converted. We'll talk about um, uh, the first call of Islam in secret and the role of Abu Bakr anhu there. We're going to talk about Abu Bakr's incidents of where he risked his life for the Prophet Wasallam. His story about how he liberated slaves, risking his life a second time. We're going to talk about his migration to Abyssinia and the story around there that will really interest us. We'll talk about his migration with the Prophet, peace be upon him, to Medina. We will talk about some stories around that migration and I'm going to I'll probably disappoint some of you with some stories that you've always known since your childhood some of them are fabricated some of them are weak but we'll leave that till next week inshallah like a cliffhanger and we'll talk about on his way to Medina and what happened some miracles that happened with a man called Suraq ibn Malik radiallahu anhu we'll talk about some certain incidents in Medina and lessons of disagreements between the Muslims and how they dealt with them and we can learn from them when we have disagreements among us. We'll talk about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Aisha's marriage radiallahu anha. We'll talk about some family feuds that happened between the Prophet peace be upon him and his wife Aisha and how Abu Bakr radiallahu anha, her father came in to help them with their domestic issues. And we'll talk about his participation in the battles with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's what we'll talk about inshallah next week. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala preserve you, bless you. And please, if I'm taking too long, you're allowed to let me know inshallah. I don't want to drain you because it is historical. But with Abu Bakr stories next week, you're going to be intrigued. You're going to be so 
into it, insha'Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all, and insha'Allah, I'll see you next week with part two of the uh, Caliph, Khalifa series. وهذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته